I'm not asking you for a promise. I'm giving you an order. You will not insult my memory. There will be no revenge. I will die, and no one else here or anywhere will suffer. What about me? If there's something I could do about that, I would. I guess we're both just gonna have to be brave. Hey everybody, so when I got up this morning, I thought to myself, hmm, yeah, I think I'll commit social suicide and talk about one of the most controversial Doctor Who episodes yet created, Hellbent. People hate this episode a lot, and to be honest, me personally, I've never hated a Doctor Who episode, even something like Fear Her, which does literally everything wrong. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't want to watch it if I had a choice, but I don't attack the episode or its creators like some people do with this episode. And I really wish people would quit that shit, it's really aggressive. Life lesson here from a 17 year old. Don't attack someone online because you don't like the episode of Doctor Who they created. That has got to be one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. We all live together on this planet, so let's practice empathy, huh? <laughs> it's like Clara said. Hatred is too strong an emotion to waste on someone that you don't like. So. Let's make love and not war, right? Anyways, Hellbent. Like I said, I really don't hate any episodes, and that includes this one. But I really want to analyze this episode thoroughly, looking at each of the pillars of art that make up cinema. Thinking about it, the chapter format for my first Doctor Who video essay works perfectly for this. Which, if you haven't seen, guys, you are missing out. That was a big video for me. I put a lot into it. You guys will love it. But what we're going to do is take the chapter format from that video and spruce it up into what I'm going to call the four pillars of cinema. Foundational art pieces that all have to come together to make a great work of cinema. We're going to analyze each one and try to see exactly where Hellbent gets it all wrong and where Hellbent gets it all right. Let's take a look. So, the first pillar up is the writing. This is where a lot of people have problems with this episode. The first thing you got to know is that this episode is technically the third part of a three-part story. Face the Raven, Heaven Sent, and then Hellbent. In the first part, Face the Raven, we see a former character, Riggsy, return and he has a tattoo on his neck that's counting down and there's a secret street with aliens disguised as people and a shielder is back, another former character who the Doctor turned into a mortal to save her life and she was the focus of that one really bad episode and she's the one killing Riggsy and they have to convince all the alien people that he didn't kill this lady with two heads who has a son who's actually a girl and the girls of this race can see into people's future and it turns out the mom was alive the whole time and a shielder was evil and she wasn't and she's just working for some and Clark took the tattoo from Riggsy at the chains of terms of the and then she dies. Very eventful episode. And then it's follow-up episode, Heaven Sent. HOLY SHIT! This is the best episode of Doctor Who in my opinion. See my Doctor Who video essay for details on that. Seriously, I get rolling on this episode, so let's just move right- Wait, but do you remember the part where he jumped out the window and they did the whole Sherlock Holmes thing? Wow, that was great. Uh, and there was the other part where his clothes were laid out in front of the, um... In front of... <clears throat> sorry. It's, uh, it's really good. And then Hellbent came after that came after the best episode of Doctor Who. So yeah, I would say expectations were pretty high for this episode, and this is the part where I piss literally everyone off. I'd say Hellbent really delivers. But what about Clara Sendoff, I hear you asking? Relax, my friends. Everything in its time. At first, we have to start at the beginning. The episode starts where Heaven Sent ended. The Doctor escaping the confession dial and finding himself outside the Citadel on Gallifrey. As it turns out, the Doctor is not very happy with the Time Lords as of right now because... Gee, I don't know, they were kind of responsible for this and this and this and they've also always been dicks, so... Time Lords are not in a very good position right now. The Doctor holds them accountable for everything that related to Clara's death. Except, isn't this Clara's fault? Of course the Time Lords were responsible for both the Chronolock and getting Clara on that street but the rest was all her doing. She found out that the chronolog can be exchanged, she made the decision to trade, she made the decision not to tell anyone, therefore she is responsible for her death, and she went out knowing this. I mean, wow was this exchange beautiful. What a send off. However, the doctor just isn't gonna have it. It's like River said. He doesn't like endings. 
So since he figured out it was the Time Lords, a power that, if you'll recall, the Doctor has never had access to up until this moment because all the Time Lords were dead at the end of the universe until he saved it in Day of the Doctor two years ago in Series 7. And who was the current companion in 2013? Clara. So the Doctor loses his first companion post Gallifrey being back at their hands, and just so happens to find himself on their sandy shores right after breaking out of his confession dial, something that is supposed to be paradise for a Time Lord after death but had been weaponized to extract information from the Doctor. Yeah, I'd say he'd be a little pissed at them. So to move forward from this moment, we see him stomping his foot at the Time Lords, kicking Rassilon off the planet. A fucking awesome. And then, with the Doctor's new power as President of Gallifrey, he convinces the General that Clara, who is dead, has some information about the hybrid that might be of use to Gallifrey. And as it turns out, Time Lords have access to what is known as an extraction chamber, a device that can extract a person at the end of their life and loop their processes, mainly to gain information from someone who might have died. These were presumably invented during the Time War to get information from dead soldiers about the Daleks' plans of advancing in the war. However, the Doctor's planning on using this for more than just information, because as it turns out, Clara doesn't know anything about the hybrid. The Doctor wants to use the extraction chamber to save Clara's life. In order to get away with it, he has to steal the General's gun and shoot him with it, triggering a regeneration. Okay, so how do we justify all of this? The, the Doctor's never done anything like this before. Well, it's important to remember that Capaldi is the first in a brand new turbulent regeneration cycle. And he's not exactly been a perfect doctor so far. He's made mistakes and had trouble finding his identity for the whole of his first series. But if we could go back to this moment from deep breath. And however scared you are, Clara, the man you are with right now, the man I hope you are with, believe me, he is more scared than anything you can imagine right now. And he, he needs you. Capaldi is terrified of being alone. Ever since this regeneration cycle started, Clara was there from day one. He relied on her quite a bit to tell her when he fucked up, flashback to these exchanges. It's clear the Doctor is having difficulty operating as a good person without Clara to fall back on. And we remember in Series 8 how Capaldi was kind of a dick to everyone. He had trouble opening up to people, including Clara. She had to put up with a lot of his jeering and bullying, for lack of a better word, because this is a guy that's been through this song and dance over and over, loving and losing again and again and again. This is him not subjecting himself to that pain anymore. So when he abandons the charade after Death in Heaven, and we see the Series 9 Capaldi, someone who has reluctantly opened his heart again, he's hugging people again, flashback to this, and then the literal second he decides to take those hits again, she dies. This is devastating. Surely much more devastating than any other companion lost so far. Not because Clara is special, which I believe is the public's reception of this stuff, but because this wound cuts much deeper because of Capaldi and everything that his doctor has been subjected to so far. Okay, makes sense. Everyone happy so far? Moving on. The doctor and Clara escape to the cloisters, presumably Gallifrey's form of catacombs. It's the database for the Matrix, Gallifrey's storage index, which is the biggest storage index in the universe. Within the Matrix are enemies the Doctor has faced, all attacked and imprisoned by the Matrix, as this database is apparently able to physically protect itself from those who attempt to steal information from it. It's a pretty cool concept. And should someone penetrate the Matrix defenses? Littered around the cloisters are the Cloister Wraiths, creatures wearing Time Lord outfits who attack anyone who attempts to leave the cloisters. And the Doctor and Clara just waltzed right in. Well, how are they gonna get out? It turns out the Doctor knows of a secret trap door that, if you find and unlock, the Wraiths will allow you to leave. He knows this because he wandered in here as a kid, where the Wraiths told him this information. The newly regenerated General and Ohila from the Sisterhood of Karn stand on the edge of the cloisters, careful not to enter. They try to bargain with the Doctor and Clara, and rationalize his decision to save Clara's life. We get some nice moments with Clara, like this one. Why would you even do that? I was dead. I was dead and gone. Why? Why would you even do that to yourself? Stuff like this makes me not think this episode is bad because it's not fetishizing the Doctor's decision to save her. They are acknowledging that he is making the wrong choice, with Clara being the voice of reason. It's clear that she's accepted her death and doesn't want to be responsible for the destruction of time. However, the Doctor convinces her for a moment, and has her distract the Time Lords as he escapes through the hatch to retrieve a TARDIS. The Doctor now attempts to break out of Clara's time loop so that her heart will start beating again and they can zoom off for more adventures. However, it doesn't seem to be working as they fly further and further away from Gallifrey, and the Doctor realizes it's not going to work. The Doctor had retrieved a device called a Neural Block, and it's used to wipe someone's memory. 
The Doctor, of course, intends to use it on Clara so that she might be able to live on without him. Really great character moment shenanigans ensue, and the Doctor ends up losing his memories. And that's how the episode ends. So, what's bad about this episode? The Diner Tardis. Literally the only thing I have a problem with. With this episode, you really have to dig for the more tricky character motivations, which is why I believe people don't like it. On the surface, some of the shit makes literally no sense, and some of it still doesn't make sense with context. But at large, this episode does not fail. The only thing it does wrong in my eyes is it really jumbled up Clara's exit, and obviously I do believe we got an inferior send-off to Face the Raven. But just because this episode retcon Face the Raven's ending doesn't make this new ending bad. In fact, I really like all the Neuroblock stuff, and obviously I've spoken on how important I think it is that the Doctor breaks his own rules, and, more importantly, realizes that breaking them was wrong, which is drama we definitely didn't get in Face the Raven. And of course, Tardis Diner. This is really dumb, I wish Clara actually died, but, like, the rest of this episode, Doctor Shooting the General, Doctor Mad at Rassilon, all that, perfectly acceptable, and some of it is downright great in my eyes. I can see why people don't like it, but this is not a failure in its writing pillar in the slightest. Is it even a question where Hellbent falls in terms of cinematography? I mean, this shot ranked number two in my top 10 favorite shots of all time for a reason, and the whole episode shares this treatment. Why? Rachel Talloway. Literally every single episode she's directed stands out as some of the most inventive, colorful, and unique episodes ever with heavy emphasis on lighting, framing, and scale. She clearly knows her way around cameras, and need I remind you, she's the brilliant mind behind every single frame of Heaven Sent, the best episode. I honestly think I can leave it right there. Here, let's do a real quick montage to end this video. Doctor Who always excels at acting. To rephrase what I said in my first video essay, Doctor Who is a big fucking deal. If you, a British actor, get an invitation onto Doctor Who, you would legitimately freak the fuck out. I mean, I would at least. So once you get on that set, you better believe every single cast member is giving it their all, and duh, everyone here is great. Honestly, I really like the new Rassilon they got for this. Obviously, they couldn't get Timothy Dalton again, so given the circumstances, this works really well. But obviously, the heart and soul of this episode are the performances of Peter Capaldi and Jenna Coleman. And listen, I always have good things to say about Capaldi, and yes, of course, he's incredible here. But I'd like to draw everyone's attention to how incredible Jenna Coleman is right now. That was some damn good acting, and the chemistry these two have is undeniable. We have tons of great banter and emotional moments, and the crux of the story, the Doctor losing his memories that is, works incredibly well, mainly because these two actors are amazing. This exchange, this exchange, man. Amazing. No other words for it. Jenna went out with a bang, and this is without a shred of a doubt, her best performance in the show. And yeah, Capaldi is amazing. I mean, did anyone have any doubts? He plays deeply enraged so well. And look at this, look at this face. That face proves I wasn't reaching with my analysis of Capaldi's character motivations in the scene earlier. He just knows, man. He knows how to play his doctor, and he fucking kills it, man. Like, it's amazing. A lot of 12's complexion through his tenure is fed to us not in the script, but in Capaldi's mannerisms. I mean, how amazing is that? I love that. Like, like here, here. In the pilot, the doctor is about to wipe Bill's mind, and she says this. But imagine... Imagine how it would feel if someone did this to you. That, he's remembering Clara in some subconscious somewhere he remembers. That means that 
all of this did have a purpose. I mean, really, how do you get this far with a facial expression? Ladies and gentlemen, Capaldi, my favorite doctor. God damn. Alright, Murray Gold is back for Hellbent, and we have a few tracks to look at here. The tracks that make up this episode are Back Home, The General's Regeneration, A Duty of Care, Clara's Diner, and both Face the Raven and of course A Good Man Return to feature in this episode. Murray Gold always does spectacular stuff, and I really couldn't think of any other tracks scoring Gallifrey. Most of these are a mesh of This is Gallifrey, obviously, and like some heaven sent mannerisms, which is good. These tracks are great, of course, my favorite being Face the Raven. There's a reason they brought it back for this episode, it's a terrific and sad piece. And then we have Clara's Diner, which is what the Doctor plays in the diner to Clara in the episode. I really hope that's actually Peter Capaldi playing that, because the dude actually plays guitar. I really hope it is. I'm gonna be really upset if it isn't. But yeah, a nice bunch of songs here. I really have no complaints. Alright, now that we've covered everything, what exactly did Hellbent get wrong? TARDIS Diner. Oh,